Sisters, I am so excited to announce to you that I have officially opened my one-on-one coaching business as now a certified mommy millionaire life and transformation strategist. I've opened up my coaching business where you get to work with me directly to heal and transform your life. Do you have a knowing in your soul that you have more to you? Do you have this knowing and you're just not sure how to access it? Are you miserable because of it? Do you feel like you're just mom and you know that there's more than being just mom? Are you feeling stuck in your life and you know that you were created to be, have, and do more than what was already going on? Listen, I totally get you, sister. I've been there and it was one of the most crushing places to sit in. You're feeling stuck like you will never get where you want to be. You've been spinning your wheels in the dirt and are not getting there. I was there too until I hired myself a coach and that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you move from that place into a place where you know and have a deep-seated vision where you want to go and how you're going to get there. I'm here to help you to find more purpose and joy and laughter in your life. I'm I'm here to help you move from that place into a place of creative thinking, taking actions towards your goals on a daily basis. And I'm here to help you understand that there's nothing wrong with you to understand the blocks that are truly holding you back and how to break free from them. I know that my purpose is to help women just like you become free and so radically in love with your life that everything you desire becomes a reality for you. So how can you work with me? I am offering one-on-one coaching sessions for an amazing deal right now with my beta group. You get five sessions for $200 and this is going to the first 10 people who sign up with me. After that, this pricing is gonna go away and it will not be available ever again. So if you wanna work directly with me, shoot me an email at katrinalelly at gmail.com or you can always find me on Instagram or Facebook and send me a, a direct message that way. I would love to get on a call with you and talk about whether or not this would be a good fit and how we can transform your life and get you moving forward and out of that place where you feel miserable, like you have no purpose and that you're just stuck. So reach out to me because these 10 spots are going to fill up fast. Welcome back to the Just As We Are podcast. I am your host, Katrina Lally, and we have such an important episode today. I got to sit down and have a chat with Dr. Sarah Mitchell, who was a chiropractor but training and ended up finding her true calling, empowering parents to teach their little ones to sleep when her first child would just not sleep. She has eight years of health education training, and she was shocked that she didn't know how to get her son to sleep in an easy and sustainable manner. So she did her research and ended up finding her passion as a sleep consultant. In this episode, you guys, we talk about so many different things. She shares a little bit about her story after becoming mom and having postpartum and ended up ripping out her stitches by shoveling snow because her identity, she hadn't quite, you know, really grasped onto her identity changing from, you know, Sarah Mitchell to mom. And we talk about being able to still identify yourself and be mom and not lose yourself within that. We talk about motherhood as a transformational process, that your time becomes just so much more valuable and how the importance is to still do work that lights you up. And we know how scary that can be, but finding your passion, guys, really helps you be a role model for your children. Dr. Sarah's goal isn't to fix the sleep challenges, but rather to teach parents the skills to manage the current sleep challenge and those that will be upcoming as your child ages and changes. You know, she works with parents, not just about sleep, but it's also about figuring out who your little person is, who you are as a parent, and what you thought your parenting journey would look like. Dr. Sarah wants parents to know that you can be loving, attached, and well-rested. She's coached hundreds of parents in their first parenting challenge, getting their little ones to sleep. She's from Silicon Valley. Her private coaching clientele varies from high-profile corporate leaders to overwhelmed stay-at-home moms. You know, and the common denominator with all of this is sleep challenges. We also talk about some of her tips and tricks on like how to get better sleep, not just about babies, but you for mamas too, especially during this time of crisis where stress levels are actually a lot higher. 
In 2020, you guys, in the middle of this coronavirus, she launched her Helping Babies Sleep School, which is an online membership program to guide parents from birth to age four years old with sleep education and group coaching. She feels her origins in attachment parenting, medical background, and parenting challenges with a son with ADHD have given her a whole wide range of tools to help struggling parents. I loved this conversation. We just talked about the importance of being mom and really dove into that whole identity switch that takes place that no mom is really prepared for. Even through your pregnancy, you know, we can try to be prepared from going from, you know, who we are to mom. And there really is no easy transition into that. But you guys definitely sit down, grab a cup of tea, grab a pen and paper and dive on in. Welcome to the Just As We Are podcast. I'm Katrina Lelly, a wife, mom in recovery, certified life and transformation strategist, community cultivator, lover of people, and student of life. Each week, I'll bring you love, inspiration, share the harder things people are afraid to talk about, and guests who are willing to shine their light for you. I give you self-care practices and mindset tips to help you shatter the negative stories you tell yourself. Now is the time to step into the beautiful, loved, whole woman you already are. Let's walk this journey together. back to the Just As We Are podcast. I'm Katrina Lelly and I am here with Dr. Sarah Mitchell and I am super excited for you to be here especially during this time of kind of craziness going on and what you specialize is is so important but before we get into that just share a little bit with us about who you are, where you came from. Dr. Sarah Mitchell, I'm actually a chiropractor by training but I found my passion, empowering other parents to teach their little ones to sleep after the experience of my son not sleeping and me having eight years of health education training think that I should know what to do. And so, yeah, I teach parents how to get their kids to sleep from from birth to age four. And I also have an online class now helping moms sleep because sleep is something that is like, I'm just passionate about it overall. And I see so many people struggling. And so I created that class too, to kind of help parents, you know, be their best selves because it's a tough job that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I, um, it's so funny. We we're talking about that this morning because I've been thinking about my own sleep. So I'm excited to learn from you and to hear your story and like what, where, where you came from. So you were in chiropractic care to begin with, correct? Yeah. So I was a chiropractor and, um, and then I had my son and he just wouldn't sleep. And I was like, totally overconfident. <laughs> like, I know all about the human body and psychology, like this is going to be a breeze. And I was from a very attachment parenting focused space. Like I had a midwife and a doula for my birth. I really wanted to be on demand, potentially co-sleep. And that just didn't work out for us. I found myself you know, waking every two hours, basically to continually nurse him back to sleep. Um, I also had a really difficult birth, which was, you know, everything in hindsight is a gift because it teaches you so much, right? So my son got stuck at the shoulders on the way out because he was sunny side up. And to this day, it still astounds me how much we really don't understand about the biomechanics of birth. Like, yes, you see that video on YouTube of the child turning their head and them coming under the pubic bone and popping up. But really, you know, he was, he was the wrong way. So he couldn't get out, but they, they don't, they didn't know that at the time. Like you can't see that when it's happening. Right. And so I had like 25 people in that room trying to get him out. He was stuck at the shoulders for three minutes and turned blue. And, you know, knock on wood, we were so fortunate. They thought they broke my collar or his collarbone. They thought they broke my pelvis. They didn't. He was fine. But he was um, hypoglycemic when he came out, which meant that I actually had gestational diabetes, but I had tested negative when I took the test at 25 weeks. And I, to this day, I find it fascinating that that actually happened. Like I've told a few different OBs that I know, and a couple of them are like, no, no, that, that can't happen. But for me, it, it did. And so he was 10 pounds, four ounces. Um, wow. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've read so many different things about people having big babies and some people have them no problem. And why is that? Well, a lot of it, you know, going back to my chiropractic roots is a, it's about biomechanics. Like he just was not lined up the right way. But that was a really tough start to giving birth because here I was that type A personality. I'm capable. I'm confident. I got this nailed down. And then oof, I am like hit like, a, you know, been hit by a train after that really difficult birth. Um, and then, you know, we had our challenges like everybody does with a bit of breastfeeding and him not taking, cause he had so much sugar in his blood at the beginning. He wasn't really hungry. So we had to kind of like keep waking him up and do some assisted feeding and all that jazz. And then four days in, I was in Canada at the time, four days in, you know, I, I wanted, he was January. I wanted my driveway or my walkway to be more clear because we had people coming and going. And so I asked a few people to help me and no one did. And so eventually I just shoveled the walkway on my own, which felt fine at the time. But looking back now, that was the thing that actually caused me to rip out my deep stitches from Mm. childbirth. Yeah. And it's funny because I keep looking back. I'm like, but why did I do that? Why did I do that? Like, and it was part of that transition of letting go of who you identified yourself to be. You know, I was capable. I could do this. And and still, you know, grappling with like who I am now and what my limitations might be in different situations, because we, I really don't think that we can do it all or have it all. And I think those messages out there um, set a lot of people up to fail, you know, and, and that just applies more than just to like that after birth period to careers and whatnot as well. Um, I think that you can have a lot of it, but something, you know, shifts. It's a, it's a, it's a whole lot. You need a huge support team to be able to um, quote unquote, have it all essentially. Absolutely. I want to stop you really quick because you brought up something really interesting, like that transition into who you were, into who you are now. That's a quick transition. As much as we think we can prepare during that pregnancy, the moment that child actually arrives, that's like the divisive. This is where you are no longer who you were. This is who you are now, your mom. And I don't think there's any amount of preparation that we could ever do And losing that, for lack of a better word, losing that identity is a big deal. And I don't know that we recognize it enough. I totally agree with you. And there's, I've seen these expressions on, on Instagram, you know, a child is born, but a mother is also born and she is growing and developing. And part of that journey too, is like figuring out who you are as a parent and who your kiddo is. And especially in my practice, you know, I can give two different parents the same set of strategies to help their little ones sleep. And it'll work with some kids and not with others. And why is that? It's like, well, that's who your little person is, you know? And, and, and I have definitely had that experience. You know, I have an older boy and a younger girl, and I definitely see the difference in, in things that work for one don't necessarily work for the other, but you don't know that coming into it because you think, well, I, I was parented, so I should know how to parent. Right. (laughs) And, and what your parents did is it's completely different time for one thing. I definitely went through the experience and tell me if you can relate to this, went through through the experience where he should listen to me because I'm his mom. Oh yeah. (laughs) I still think that sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't always work out that way. So yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, so rough birth starts. I, you know, I asked all my friends, Hey, how do you get your kids to sleep? Cause that, you know, by month three, I'm like, Oh my God, like I've been at this point. So I had to go back in and get my stitches redone, the bottom ones. And then the, the, um, superficial ones still would not heal. And I don't know why, maybe cause I was sleep deprived and I wasn't giving my, my body enough energy to be healing, but I had to go back in and keep getting the, the outer skin burnt off. So they would try and reheal cause it wasn't oh, closing man. well. But yeah. Until I, yeah. For three months I did that. So um, that was really, really exhausting. And I had to bathe twice a day to try and keep everything clean. So, so it was a lot. So then I was like, okay, we need more sleep. I finally figured out the reason we're not sleeping. So how do I fix this now? Anyone, anyone? I remember asking my friend who, friend who was a physician and she was like, oh, just enjoy your baby. And I got a lot of that. And I see that so much on Facebook. Like, oh, the days are short, you know, the years are long, just it'll pass. And I really felt like, oh my gosh, am I not important here in this equation? Like, Yes, I've been doing this for months. Like I've been prioritizing my kiddo. Absolutely. Like so important. But at what point does that scale start to shift where you start to become resentful of your situation? And that is a horrible feeling to have. And I definitely felt it. 
You know, I felt resentful. And so what I realized is, you know, talking to my physician and having my healthcare background is like, oh my gosh, we think this should be such an instinctual thing, getting your baby to sleep, but it's actually not. There's nothing natural about that first part. And I think where we get off track is those first few weeks, our babies wake up, they eat, they fall back asleep. And we think, oh, okay, they know what to do. But if there's anyone listening, struggling with sleep, the first tip would be that it's your job to know when your kiddo needs to sleep. Those are called awake times. And there's a different time by month up until, you know, age two or three. And it's your job to make sleep happen. Kids just don't naturally fall asleep when they're tired. There you go. Write that one down. Yeah, no, I can relate test to that. My 19 month old right now, he will fight to stay awake. You know, when he's tired, because he gets busier. Yes, that's so true, right? That little bit of hyperactivity. And in the younger months, that just that comes up as looking a little bit wired, like their limbs start to kind of move a little bit more, which mm. is preceded usually by a calmer set of signs where your kiddo starts to disengage with you. So if you were making eye contact, they no longer want to do that. Or if they were, they start to look kind of glazed out, that's the first set of tired signs. The next set is the yawning, kind of getting fussy. And that, that, those signs, you want to be like putting them down um, pretty quickly for those first few months, essentially. Yeah, I love that we're talking about this because I don't, it, I don't, people don't talk about it. I mean, I had no idea when we first met, I was like, that's an interesting thing to be doing. I love it. Like I need to know more. And so when you reached out, I was super grateful because it's like, even now realizing my Caleb's he's 19 months, there's still things going on. It doesn't just end after that infant stage. It goes into even as a mom. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think most people struggle the most in the newborn stage because all of a sudden you're CEO in the life of a little person with like very little training, no experience and possibly no support system. You're like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. You're doing the best you can. And then I think where a lot of the criticism and judgment of other people comes is that, you know, you're in this like so intense role that you love so, so much But then you hear about somebody doing something differently, parenting in a different way than you are, and maybe getting, you know, quote unquote, like better results. And that can give you self-doubt. Gosh, am I doing this right? Oh my gosh. And often to calm those inner critics, people lash out and criticize the other people that are doing it. And I remember, I remember specifically when I had that moment with my first, because I was trying to be all natural parenting approach. And my husband mentioned a friend of theirs that does like, a feeding schedule during the day. And I was like, what? No, that doesn't sound right. Like never even considering the possibility of, oh, let me look, tell me more about that. I was just too fresh. I think he was like six weeks old at the time. I was like, no way, man, we are feeding on demand. I like, that is something that I am doing. And my story is that I actually had to move away from those principles because they just weren't working for us. And now in my newborn class, I do teach like a feeding window. It's not a schedule. It's a window. Like, hey, have you ruled out all these other things before you assume that it's hunger? Because I find in the newborn stage, um, zero to four months, and I definitely did this. And tell me if this resonates with you again, is that I mistook the signs of fatigue for hunger. And so I just kept feeding him, right? Like he was eating like every two hours during the day for a month. Yes. And yeah, you did that too, right? I think we, so many of us do that because we don't know. We don't, you don't know how to tell the difference. The, the nuances between the signs are so subtle. Um, in the end, what we end up doing is what I did is teaching him that the boob is a soother. And so then every time he wakes in the night, he needs that to go back to sleep. And then when you hit that four month sleep regression, when they really wake up to the world, that's <laughs> when, you know, you really feel it, feel it the most. So um, yeah, yeah. No, I, lo- I love that so much. And I didn't know the difference. You're right. I didn't know the difference. Even with Caleb, you know, having the twins who are 11 and then with Caleb, I still didn't really realize that's a big gap between having kids and you do forget a lot. You forget yeah. all about that stuff that goes on and how to be a, mo- a new mom again in a way. And so I love that we're just, that we're talking about this and I want to kind of take it to that whole, um, you know, motherhood as a transformational process and, you know, remembering that we do have an identity in this. I'm so passionate about this, but I don't share it enough myself. Like my kids are not my identity. I Mm -hmm. am not, I still get to do what I want to do. They don't, they are not the leaders of my life for Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all have our own path and timeline to that kind of realization. 
And I think I work with a lot of people at the beginning where the need to be, the, the, they enjoy the need to be needed. So that waking every two up, you know, up every two hours. And I think I fell into that a little bit too. Like that idea that, wow, I'm so needed. And wow, I'm really meeting his needs is very um, fulfilling to a certain point, right? And everybody has a different endpoint. But then you can hit that part where you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm starting to feel resentful now, but now I feel guilty trying to just, just you know, pull away a little bit because I kind of created this and they obviously need me so much. And my one of my one of my taglines is like, don't forget that you are an important person too. So I like to think of our mom baby relationship as like on a scale and it needs to be equal. And when it starts to slant one way or the other, that's when you know things get out of whack and people start to feel resentful or clingy or you know exhausted. And so, you know, my my journey was, you know, out of out of chiropractic and into sleep consulting is, you know. Like I, part of the joy of being a sleep consultant is that I set my own hours and that I create my own schedule and I have flexibility and I have time to be with my kids because I also realized that working like a 40 to 50 hour work week and trying to be a mom just was not going to work for me. I was going to be angry and resentful. And so part of this journey is figuring out what you're capable of really, what makes you happy what makes you happy? That is a hard one because we're often tied to ideals. The ideals of who I was before I had a baby might've been a career woman, you know, making six figures, working all these hours, having a certain title. Um, But does that really make me happy now that I have these other things in my life that are very demanding on me, very enjoyable, but how do I balance that all out? And I think that really shifts once you have kids and it takes people different lengths of time to get to to that kind of realization of who, who are, who are they essentially? Yeah. Those are such good, important uh, tips that you laid out there. And it, that ideal, like that we tie ourselves to as moms, who is it that really makes us happy? So how do we find that out? Like, how do we, that's the big question that I get from a lot of my girlfriends. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't want to be just mom. And I can absolutely relate to that, but I'm not just mom. I'm not just Josh's wife. I'm not, you know, there's more to Mm -hmm. it than that. And I think Mm -hmm. we get stuck in that space. So we don't go do anything that helps us find that happiness. Absolutely. And I think the first thing like therapy, I've definitely been to therapy. Life coaches are amazing people that can also help you. Um, That definitely helped me. What about you? How did you figure it out? Absolutely the same. Um, Lots of um, recovery work through recovery programs, but also hiring a coach, you know, Mm -hmm. really having somebody there to hold you accountable and to bounce those ideas off of and to be that's what I love about a coach. They actually hold your feet to the fire and they're like, Hey, you said you wanted to do this. Let's go. And, Mm -hmm. and then with what the kind of coaching I do and the kind of coaching that Kayla does that we both know, um, there's some healing that takes place in there too. The healing is so important. And I think a lot of us, and I I'm definitely guilty of this, having been type A and very capable. It's like, you don't want to expose your vulnerabilities, especially if you've been in the corporate world, you've been like honed and taught not to expose those vulnerabilities. But that's really where the most important work and the most valuable work is done. Um, And yes, I, you know, Kayla coaches me as well. And I think she's phenomenal at what she does. And the program that she's taught with all of the life coaches is so valuable. I started with a life coach initially to help me figure out what exactly did I want my life to look like? Because we think of our, like, it's, it's, it's not just work. It's the whole big picture. They definitely overflow. You know, in sleep teaching, we talk about how your nights and your days are actually really intermingled. It's the same with, you know, your happiness, your, your work life and your home life are intermingled completely. You can't focus on one only and think you can get happiness out of that. It has to be a complete picture. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I am such an advocate for that. And so I'm glad that we're talking about it because I see too many moms out there who, um, are feeling so unfulfilled and unhappy and it doesn't have to be what they do, but you know, getting that healing and finding what makes them happy and you can still be a stay at home mom or, and you can still be a working mom, but -hmm. what is really that, that fulfillingness that is missing and how do we, how do we uncover that and how do we start moving forward with it? Mm -hmm. I love that. I so love that. So right now, we're in a very stressful time with, you know, the world is virtually shut down. You know, there's a lot of stress going on. Kids are home from school. 
moms um, who work are, you know, maybe struggling right now who to find childcare or who have been laid off or have had to quit working or stay at home moms are not used to having their kids at home. Hello. Um, mm-hmm. All day, 24 seven. And so there's a lot more stress that's going on and that's coming through to mom and child. You know, mm-hmm. let's talk about that a little bit. Like what are some things in relation to the sleep? Because I, I know sleep is so important. Um, mm-hmm. How can we, you know, what are some things that you have that can help them during this time? Sure. Well, um, um, you can edit this out, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I just don't have a brain fart there for a second. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, this is a great time to actually be working on sleep because often when I'm working with uh, clients, I'll say to them, okay, make sure you have like three or four days to be home without any social activities to dedicate towards your child's sleep. And if you have some major sleep issues, so for the parents out there with toddlers or babies who are waking up in the night, you know, um, you want to start by the first thing that you can do is start logging your sleep because it gives you a really good picture of what's happening. If you're a parent not sleeping well, this is actually a great tool as well, because it's just more data to help you notice patterns and quantity. Because sometimes we feel like, God, I, you know, I had a terrible sleep last night. And then you look at it and you're like, well, you were in bed for eight or nine hours. So then it becomes not a quantity, but a quality of sleep question. And similarly for our little ones with feeding and sleeping and whatnot, it can feel like we got, you know, people tend to underestimate the amount of sleep that they're getting as well. So that's the first thing is for logging sleep. Then you got to figure out why are you being challenged with sleep? So with little ones, there's two reasons why kids don't really sleep well, right? The first one is they're overtired. So they're not getting enough sleep over 24 hours. And this kicks you into a bit like a sleep debt. And then it makes it harder to fall asleep and then stay asleep. And one of the main signs of being overtired is I see it so frequently is waking up like every hour after midnight. Very, very common overtired sign. But the other ones are short naps. Apps, you know, night wake ups taking a long time to settle. The second reason most toddlers and babies have challenge with sleep is that they have something called a sleep crutch, something external that helps them relax into sleep. And so then when they wake up in the night, which all humans do, they cry out for that same sleep crutch. So mostly for me, it was nursing to sleep, but there's also rocking, having a bottle, sucking from a pacifier, and sometimes even just being next to one. So those toddlers that need somebody to lie beside them or a nine month old who co-sleeps, just that physical proximity is something that helps relax them into sleep. And that's when you need self-soothing skills. So self-soothing skills is the ability, like you and I both have them, we fall, climb into bed at night, find our favorite position, can turn off our brains and relax into sleep. So for anyone zero to four, kiddos that age, I have a, a helping baby sleep school where you can watch the class that applies to your child's age and then come into my Facebook group where I do live twice a week to take all your questions. So it's, we're a super tight knit community where we're helping one another because what I found is people take, can buy a book or they can take a class, but you always have follow-up questions about what your child is doing. Is this normal or this is kind of unique? There's a lot of unique stuff out there because our kiddos are unique. So I want to be there for the people on the journey to, to help them with that. So that's helping babies sleep school. And then for parents, and included in that class is helping moms sleep. And so the idea with parenting right now, you're like, yes, you have so much to do. And, you know, it goes back to probably a lot of the skills that you teach in your life coaching is like prioritizing, scheduling and planning and preparation. Like even last night, like we kind of fallen off the rails these last few days and I feel like our academic time is not going so well so last night I set it all up like so that when we get up in the morning because you're throwing into it that I have planned out what they're going to be doing today and at what times right now with your sleep another thing that I've been noticing and tell me if this resonates with you is that I'm starting to stay up later each night watching dumb tv Mm -hmm. are you doing that yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) right and what happens now is that I'm going to bed later and I need a lot of sleep. That's part of my passion for sleep is because I need a lot of it. I have an autoimmune disorder and that's, that's on my journey. That's one of the things of just accepting that about myself. I'm not the person that gets up at 5 a.m. to go to the gym and I'm okay with that now, even though that's who I identified with originally, that's just not who I am. If I can get up 15 minutes before my kids, half an hour, whoop, that's a big win for me. Right. And I know so many of the parenting coaches I consulted with earlier on, because I do have a very challenging son said, you know, you got to get up early before the kids. I'm like, oh my God, I am so tired. I just can't do that. I wish they could have said to me, wake up 15 minutes before they get up, give yourself 15 minutes just to check your email and do your social media. If that's what makes, you know, if that's what lights you up, 
wake up 15 minutes earlier and do your daily affirmations. My God, aren't those powerful? Like, I know you must be doing them because that's mm-hmm. part of our, oh my God, those are so worthwhile. Um, and, you know, do that. But now because I'm staying up later, I'm finding it harder to do that. So last night I was like, no, I am not turning that TV on tonight or I am turning it off by a certain time and then read fiction, escape from reality, have something that you can look forward to. You climb into that bed, you get comfortable, warm, cozy, you're lying down, your brain signaling you that it's time to sleep. You read 10 minutes, you take your brain somewhere else away from the pandemic, away from the anxieties of homeschooling, away from all the work that you have to do. And then you have an easier time relaxing and into sleep. So giving you the permission to read fiction is like huge right now. And then when you're watching the TV, the other thing I say to myself is, how is this adding value to my life right now? Mm, mm -hmm. It's not usually the answer is it's not. Um, And so because what's happening is as you stay up later, your body for a while is used to waking up at the same time. So you're just losing overnight sleep and you're waking up tired. And then you're relying on the coffee, right, as that special pick me up to help get you more energy. And maybe it's two cups. And I don't think there's anything wrong with coffee. I'm I personally find that it can increase my anxiety. So in times of stress, when my anxiety is rising, I find that's when I actually want the coffee. It's really interesting. And then it's just like a, a, you know, a feedback loop that makes it worse. So maybe avoid the coffee, maybe substitute some special teas in or something. Um, but you know, uh, try and get yourself back on track so that you can have those 10 minutes to get up. Then the other thing to think about is interrupting your sleep, the quality of your sleep. There's a bunch of things. Food, so caffeine, that's where I was going with that. Caffeine can definitely interrupt your sleep because this is really cool. Okay. We have a buildup of a protein in our blood that signals our brain when it's time to sleep and things like exercise help build that drive. So that's why if you exercise during the day, you usually sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. Things like coffee actually inhibit that buildup. Um, And so that's why they can interrupt your sleep. And it doesn't always show up at bedtime, but it can show up in like the second half of your night. Same with red wine. Red wine has histamines in it. And histamines are part of the vigilance cycle of keeping you awake. And so often red wine throws wreaks havoc in your night between like midnight and 6 a.m. And it shows up as frequent wakings. I don't know. Have you ever experienced that yourself? Yeah, I have. I can, I definitely know with the caffeine. For me, the coffee doesn't do anything really. I don't feel like it does during the day, but sometimes at night I'm like, Whoo. I have, yes. my brain doesn't shut off very well to begin with. I have a very active brain and a very vivid dreams. And so I can tell, it's like, what was I doing before I went to bed? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And I'm, I become more, I noticed I've become more sensitive to caffeine over the years. So now like diet Coke in the afternoon can cause me not to sleep and chocolate, uh, you know, and the other thing is the national sleep foundation would like us not to eat any food, like two hours before we go to bed. Um, as you know, it's just diverting blood then to different organs, helping you digest. So yeah, I, I try and not get out of that habit. Right. I've definitely done it of like snacking while watching, you know, tiger King or something crazy. Like that. <laughs> right? Popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that can help too. Um, yeah. And meditations of obviously like there's so many great um, apps available to us now is like the calm app can be really helpful. Even just listening to like a YouTube um, video on meditation at night, just to help turn your brain off. I think that's where most people struggle. The, the two places people struggle with falling asleep at night and then waking up at like two and not being able to go back to sleep. And if you do wake up at two and can't go back to sleep, like after 15, 20 minutes, take a break, just get up, go do something meaningless. Maybe you're going to wipe down the, the cupboards or wipe down the counters in your kitchen, something meaningless, and then come back and try again. Because where people, the other place people get off track is that they like start fighting it and lying there and they get really frustrated and then it gets harder. And then they start worrying about the lack of sleep they're going to have for the next day. And it just becomes this huge snowball. And again, like, you know, the mental part of this is so important. So if you're having a bad night, just say to yourself, it's okay. I'm going to be able to function tomorrow. I can do this one day. No big deal. I'll go to bed earlier tonight. It'll just be fine. Take the pressure off yourself about it. Um, But those are two tricks that can help. Mm, I love that because what we tell ourselves is so important. And so what I never would have even thought in the middle of the night to say, Oh, you know, it's okay. You know, all of that. So I love that. (laughs) What a nice, Mm, that's so much fun. So what are you, what is 2020? I mean, it's thrown in a wrench for sure, but what are you working on creating this year for yourself and your business? 
Well, I actually just launched Helping Babies Sleep School. Before it was um, online classes, and I just put it into one and added the the follow up coaching via the mentorship program. So I actually launched that like March 25th, mid coronavirus. So obviously, I had to you know reassess my expectations, and I'm just trying to roll with it. I feel really grateful right now that I took a mindfulness class starting in January, and I feel like that's funny, you don't feel the results right away. But I feel like it's kind of permeated into my life in general that I'm trying to stay really calm, cool and collected. I feel very grateful in a lot of ways for our current situation. You know, we, 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 I have my husband has a pretty steady full time job. So that that, you know, is helpful. But then for, for those people out there who, um, you know, are really being affected financially, I just, I, I, I feel for you. Um, I, I hope that you're able to find, you know, different income streams and be creative, but also like just to take a deep breath and think like, you know, this too shall pass. This is, we're going to come out of this. Trying to stay positive in the days of, of darkness can be um, one of the only things you can do. And, you know, that lack of control is a really interesting thing too. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I'm going to parlay this back to sleep teaching, which is kind of weird because they don't really fit. And this whole economic pandemic thing is far, far greater and more serious. And I don't want to minimize it in any way. But we think about like training our kids to sleep. And I hate training because we don't, we train dogs, but we teach our kids, right? But if people think that it's cruel and that it's um, mean, and there's different ways to do it to be much more gentle, but essentially it is the first time that you're teaching a little one a skill. And you think it's all about control, but it's actually about giving up control. Because in the past, you were able to get them back to sleep with nursing, rocking, bottle feeding, whatever. You could control that to a certain extent. And when you decide that you can't do that anymore, you have a plan and a roadmap for how you're going to respond to the tears and offer comfort and offer night feeding and that type of thing. Because one other thing, people think that you can't teach your baby to sleep and still feed them in the night. But with the way I do it, you absolutely can. But really, that whole process is actually about giving up control. Being able to say, I can't control you. I can't, you cannot control your 19 year, 19 month old, right? But I can control the way that I respond to you, Mm -hmm. right? You see the parlays, like same with our lifetime situation. I can't control what's going on right now. All I can do is control the thoughts in my head, how I respond to you, what I say to you and my actions. And that's really scary when you've been spending months nursing, rocking these kiddos to sleep, um, but that your child is capable. Yeah. A lot of us don't like that. A lot of us don't like that we can't control. And you're right in, in thinking related to, I can't control my 19 month old, but I can't, what, I, what can I control? That's the question to ask. What can I control? And it's myself and how I react and what I do and my choices. Mm-hmm. What he does, I can't control. I mean, I can stop him from doing certain things, but ultimately I can't control what he's doing. And the same in the world. I cannot control what is going on with this pandemic or this outbreak. And I cannot control, you know, what choices are being made for us or the people who are choosing to go crazy over it. Absolutely. Or the people who are, so someone, I was at at a park, um, probably right near the beginning, I was at a park with our neighbors and we were all social distancing, but we just needed to get outside, right? And we were standing in front of the playground. Our kids weren't on the playground, but we were standing in front of it. And someone took our picture and posted it on like the neighborhood thing and shamed us for that. And I thought, I got really mad at the beginning. And then I was like, it's okay, it's okay. I can't control her, right? I can only control how I can react to her. And what she's doing, she's trying to control her own anxieties by lashing out at us and publicly Mm -hmm. shaming us. I was like, it's okay. It's all right. Deep breath. It was a hard one. I mean, these lessons pop up in every, every day in places that you don't think, you don't realize they're going to be. Um, But it's the same premise. It's the same, your teachings, essentially. Yeah, it totally is. It's so interesting. You'll find them a lot right now in Facebook groups and community groups and There's a few times that I've had to be like, nope, okay, I'm not going to respond to that. I'm not going to try to be the voice of reason and all of that because they don't want to see a voice of reason right now. Um, So so that's when you close it and you walk away and you go do something that you can control. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. I totally resonate with that. Totally resonate (laughs) with that. I've had that experience too. I love that. Is there Mm -hmm. anything else that's on your heart to share with our audience? Oh, gosh. Well, I would just like to, for anyone struggling with sleep, I would just like you to be released of the idea that you should know what to do. Mm. You don't. There's an entire industry based around teaching your kiddos to sleep. So 
you know, it's not natural and instinctual like we think it should be. And I also want anyone struggling with their kiddos sleep to remember that they are an important person too in the equation and that teaching your baby to sleep is not a harmful, cool thing. It's giving your child one of the greatest gifts, which is being able to relax themselves down into sleep. And you can do this confidently and compassionately. You just need a roadmap to success and some guidance and, and that you are an important person too. So that's kind of what I just like to share with them. Mm, so important and such a good message. This episode with you being here now is so timely and so important and vital. So I'm grateful that to have you here and to be able to share your message and your expertise with our audience. I have a lot of mamas that listen that are probably pulling their hair out right now and a lot of friends with some young babies and just remembering that we're so, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be okay with your baby. It's going to be okay with what's going on in the world. It's going to be okay. In fact, we are okay. Mm -hmm. And remembering that is so, so timely. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us today. It was my pleasure to be here and connect with you. And thank you for the work that you do in the world. So valuable. Absolutely. Where can we find you at? Yeah, my company is helpingbabiessleep.com. And you can head over there. There's actually a pop-up sleep quiz. So if you're struggling with sleep and you just want some general ideas, it'll ask you questions about your baby's age and give you like a high five for things that you're doing right. And one simple suggestion that you can implement. So that's a great place to start. I've, re- I've been blogging about sleep since 2013. So the blog is up there as well. And if you're looking, you'd, you'd like to take an online class, it's helpingbabiesleepschool.com. Love that. Thank you again. And I cannot wait to get this episode out for all of our listeners. Thank you. Hi, friends. If you enjoyed this episode of the Just As We Are podcast, it would mean so much to me if you would head on over to iTunes and leave me a five-star review. Take a screenshot of today's episode and tag me at Katrina Lelly on your social media. If you haven't already, head on over to the Just As We Are podcast community on Facebook and hit join where you will get to join more of the Just As We Are tribe. And remember that no matter where you are on your journey, you are completely whole and loved just as you are.